table's in a slightly different spot, so it's liking to wobble tonight, but that'll be all right. Uh, so this evening, uh, we're going to be mainly in Matthew chapter 3. As always, we'll be flipping around in different places, but uh, the main narrative, the main text of the gospel that we're going to be diving into this evening is going to be coming from Matthew chapter 3, beginning in the 13th verse. So if you want to go ahead and uh, turn there or get ready for that. Also, we will meet again next Monday, a week from today at 6.30 p.m., uh, same place, uh, same time right here. And then uh, the next mosaic after that would be Sunday, September 11th at 9.30 a.m. here in the worship center. Uh, so keep that in mind for scheduling purposes, and we'll also try to keep everyone abreast uh, through all the various channels uh, interestingly, uh, last week I gave the kind of uh, heads up about a possibility of uh, a Monday Torah class. I received a lot of favorable response, uh, not only from individuals here uh, at Emmanuel or in the Macomb area, but literally from around the world. So for you guys that watch online, uh, including South Africa, uh, England, uh, Canada, uh, among other states such as Indiana, Kentucky, Texas, and so forth. Uh, those are just some of the places I received emails uh, encouraging that we would have a Monday Torah class. So it looks like we'll be headed that way. Um, that would be taking place on Monday evenings in the chapel. Uh, I think that'll be a nice cozy environment for us. And so we're going to start looking and working towards that. And it would probably begin... Monday, October 17th, I believe, and that would get us in sync with the lectionary throughout the world that begins in uh, Genesis 1 uh, during that week. Uh, so stay tuned for more information about that, but thank you everyone for uh, your feedback. Uh, so let's get started now. Let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. We pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we would so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we would embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, please grab it and hold it up, or you can grab one of the Bibles in the pew uh, and hold that up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. Jesus is who it says he is. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. My mind is alert. By God's grace, my heart is receptive. The Bible is the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living Word of God. My encounter with the Bible today will transform and grow my faith. And we say together, in Jesus' name, amen. So I said we'll be uh, cracking it open in Matthew chapter 3 as our main point of narrative. Um, and we're still kind of in a John the Baptist frame of mind. This is about our third week that we'll be doing this uh, with our friend John. Uh, it'll, it'll really set things up nicely for where we're going to fall on that Sunday, September 11th, because uh, it should fall that right then on that Sunday, we will encounter Jesus' first miracle at Cana. And so for those that maybe didn't engage in Mosaic uh, through uh, the summer, uh, but will be coming back, it'll be a great point to just kind of 
insert right away. It'll be the first miracle of Jesus, uh, that first kind of sign in John's gospel. Uh, so uh, we're, we're on a nice track for that. Uh, but to get there, we've got to get through uh, meeting John, getting to know John. And now we're at the point in the gospel narrative and in that part of Jesus' life where he is going to come forth uh, to that area of Bethany beyond the Jordan uh, to be baptized himself by John. And so that's what we're going to talk about this evening. And I don't know if it was unique to me, but for many years, I always struggled when I read the baptism account uh, or Jesus' baptism account uh, for several reasons. One, you, which we've addressed a little bit before, foreshadowing, we'll again hit on this evening. If John's baptism is a, a baptism for remission of sins, what is the sinless Son of God doing there? But also, when, as we're going to read, when Jesus presents himself and John then kind of objects and says, well, you know, really, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should, you should be the one in authority. You should be in this position. You're greater than I. You should be the one uh, overseeing my baptism, right? And what always confused me with that was Jesus' response that this is to fulfill all righteousness. And I never for a long time, had a clue what that meant. And so, again, I don't know if that was just uh, something that was just a blind spot to me or difficult for me. Uh, I wrestled with it for a long time. And so this evening, uh, hopefully if you've encountered that and are kind of like, well, yeah, what does that mean that he has to be baptized and John has to do it uh, in order for everything to be fulfilled, in order for righteousness to be fulfilled. Uh, how is that? So hopefully that'll be kind of the big aha this evening that we will unpack as we continue discovering Jesus, uh, kind of one pebble mosaic at a time. So with that, let's look in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. And again, this is John. He's, imagine the, the Sea of Galilee up north. Jordan River comes straight out the bottom of that just before it drops into the Dead Sea in the south of Israel. There's that region known as Bethany beyond the Jordan, south of Jerusalem, uh, that everyone's coming to hear John and hear his message and become part of his movement or at least come and see what's happening. And now uh, Jesus comes. And so let's read uh, the text together. Ready? Then Jesus came from the Galilee toward the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. So far away from the banks of the Jordan River where John was baptizing, the oldest son of Joseph and Mary carried on the family trade in the Galilean village of Nazareth and most probably carried on that business of, remember, Joseph and Jesus in the Gospel of Mark are called tech tones in Greek, not carpenters, but workers with hands, probably stonemasons. Uh, Nazareth, a small town, but right next to it is Sephorus, this grand Roman city uh, filled with mosaics and all kinds of stonework. Uh, so that's probably where Jesus and Joseph were making a trade and eventually Jesus alone, uh, because as most early church traditions report, uh, Joseph the carpenter and Jesus' earthly father, if you will, died some years earlier, died at a, uh, some point after Jesus' visit to the temple uh, when Jesus was 12, but at some point when Jesus was still relatively young. And per the culture of the day, Joseph left behind his oldest son as the head of the household and the provider of the family. And you can even kind of hear that toward the end of Jesus' life, where on the cross, one of his last words were to hand off who would then take care of his mother since that had been his task since Joseph had passed away. We also know from the New Testament that Jesus had at least six younger siblings. 
And though he had proven himself, no doubt, to be a precocious student uh, in the, the local school, a student of Torah, a brilliant scholar, one who had even at 12 could entertain the questions of the sages, his circumstances would not have allowed him the luxury of studying full time. His education would have largely been there in Nazareth, there with the scrolls that the synagogue, the one synagogue in Nazareth would have housed, and he would have had occasional encounters with teachers as they came through the area or at the various festivals in Jerusalem. We also know because Nazareth, remember, is Netzarim, Netzarit is branch town, uh, and so Beit Hillel, one of the grand schools, uh, the generation kind of before Jesus, had, had an academy there in Nazareth. So there would have been some scholars there in Nazareth to mentor him and uh, for him to uh, discuss matters of scripture with. Uh, and he no doubt would have also studied with his cousin John. Uh, by the very fact that he is wanting to be baptized by John and knows of John's ministry, he clearly has had some kind of interaction with John. But I kind of want to park that in your brain now because later, in a much later teaching in Mosaic, we're going to discover even more of the teaching relationship between John and Jesus, even John being Jesus' primary teacher. Uh, but you'll have to wait for that and where that's at in the Gospels. Uh, but it's certainly coming. Uh, and so John would have been someone who would have influenced him uh, as well as those from the Academy of Hillel that were up in Nazareth and in the northern Galilee area. Hillel was also from the house of David. And so we know the house of David was gathered up in that area. And so by all appearances, though, Jesus at this point before he goes to the Jordan River would have seemed to be an ordinary Jewish man in his early 30s. Uh, that is, to a complete outsider living in the first century Galilee, Jesus would not have looked all that spectacular. Uh, he would have been just a regular kind of uh, observant, religious, faithful, pious, God-fearing Jewish man. Only his mother at this point would have known the strange circumstances of his conception and his birth. Uh, and no doubt, as the Gospel of Luke has told us, she would often ponder the words that the angel spoke to her. She would under, you know, kind of wonder over the testimony of Simon, the elder priest in the temple, or Anna, the prophetess, the shepherds at Bethlehem, and those mysterious magi, those mysterious hakamim, those mysterious wise men who came from the east. And she would have also, no doubt, Mary would have treasured the memory of her aged relative, Elizabeth, who had also been caught up in the drama of angelic announcements, miraculous conceptions, and portentous births. Mary had spent the first three months of her pregnancy with Elizabeth as the elderly woman was completing the last three months of her own pregnancy. And Mary would have recalled how Elizabeth's unborn child, John, and Jesus' cousin, if you will, danced in his mother's womb at the sound of her voice. And so as Mary, now that Jesus is in his early 30s, Perhaps as Mary continues to ponder these things, maybe she's even feeling a little bit impatient for the next revelation, right? He's supposed to be this amazing, spectacular Savior, Redeemer, Messiah, but since the age of 12, um, you know, not a whole lot's happened. Uh, so maybe she's beginning to wonder if everything was as she remembered? Did she correctly understand everything? Had she misunderstood something? Had she done something incorrect? And then word about John's ministry by the Jordan would have come to her, no doubt, through their relatives. Have you heard that John, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, has appeared in the wilderness? 
in the plain of Jordan and calls all men to repent and be baptized. Many are going out to him. Many are immersing themselves in the river. By the way, what I just read or what just said to you is an exact quote from what is known as now the lost gospel to the Hebrews. We only have remnants of this particular gospel as it was quoted by certain saints uh, in the early church, mainly Justin and Jerome and Origen and a few others. They had access to it and they often quote it and they refer to it as the gospel to the Hebrews. And sometimes they'll clarify and say it's really the gospel of Matthew written in Hebrew. But all we have left of it are the quotes. And one of the quotes that we have left from it is that Mary gets news about her relative John, whom she would have known clearly as Elizabeth's son, is doing this ministry and she alerts her son to that fact and encourages him to go find out what's happening and and even sees John's ministry and the fact that it's catching on as the signal she's been waiting for that now is the moment for the next event in her son's life as he manifests himself to the world as the one sent from above, the logos, the, the one to be the redeemer. And so as more reports come, the crowds grow up, go out to John and they continue to grow larger and uh, they, they understood that he was proclaiming the commencement, the beginning of the Messianic age. And Mary wants to wait no longer. And again, according to Jerome, the church father, um, in the Gospel of Hebrews, she instigates Jesus to go make pilgrimage to John and learn from John, okay? So that would have brought him to verse 13, right? That brings us to what we just read kind of in the context of things. So in your mind, imagine John is is at the, the river and he's doing his preaching and his teaching and Individuals are coming forward for baptism and so forth. Jesus presents himself and, you know, says uh, essentially to be baptized by John meant you were doing this under John's authority, that you were submitting to John's authority, that you were going to become a disciple of John. Okay, and so now we're going to read what John's response to this is. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, Let's read that together. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. So while John certainly knew that he was preparing the way for the Messiah, he clearly felt uh, that calling in his bones, in his gut, right? Uh, That was why... Uh, He was motivated to leave the priesthood in Jerusalem. Remember, his father, Zechariah, was a priest. And so John's vocation, by default, was to be a priest. But he's not in Jerusalem. He's in the wilderness. So he clearly feels a, a different calling on his life. And that calling is to be that voice crying out in the wilderness, that one who is preparing the way and helping to make the crooked road straight and the high hills low and removing all the barriers so that the Messiah can come and that the messianic reign can come into this world and that individuals would be in a position ready to receive him. And so he knew that there would be one coming after him that would be the Messiah. He just didn't know who that Messiah was at first. While John certainly leapt in the womb at the presence of Jesus, the reality of everything probably doesn't come together until this moment at the Jordan River. Uh, So again, if you're thinking like, from a cinematic point of view that you're making a movie about this, 
You would have like John and Jesus knowing each other. You would have even Mary encouraging Jesus. You need to, you need to learn from John. You need to study with John. You need to be part of your cousin's movement, right? And John kind of teaching him and mentoring him and Jesus observing this. Uh, and, and John not putting together that this is the Messiah just yet. But at this moment, this, this, the baptism of Jesus is such a significant event, right? This is where so many things click. This is where so many things come together, not only for John, but from speaking from a human nature perspective, where a lot of stuff really comes together for Jesus as well. Okay, and so John knows that what he's doing, but until this moment, he did not know for whom he was preparing. But here, he gets it. He has that illumination. He has that insight. He has that Ruach HaKodesh moment, that Holy Spirit moment where he now gets it. And the reality of everything is kind of coming down on him. And so he says, of course, um, that, you know, We've got this backwards, right? This relationship needs to be reversed. And uh, John's prophecy about, he said, how he would know he would recognize the Messiah. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 33. He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And so there in John chapter 1, you, you also see that until the baptism of Jesus, John only knows what he's doing, that he's preparing a way. But again, not entirely sure who that individual is. But he says, this is how we'll know. We will see the Holy Spirit descend on this person, but not just descend because that as we will probably look at a few references, happens to a lot of people in the Bible. A lot of people, including like King David and others, but they don't remain. The Holy Spirit doesn't remain on that individual. So the key there is in John 1.33 that not only will we see the Spirit descend, but it will remain on this individual. That's the one who's going to baptize us not with water, but with Ruach HaKodesh, with Holy Spirit. Only after John sees the Spirit descend upon Jesus and then remain on him? Does he know the full truth? And only then does the puzzle kind of come together. According to Matthew, John the Baptist objected to the idea of Jesus, baptizing Jesus when he says, I have, no, uh, I have need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. As his cousin from Nazareth stepped forward from the crowd into the waters seeking baptism, John probably, no doubt, felt his spirit leap with inside of him just as he had once leapt in his mother's womb. And so, again, from a cinematic perspective, you would have a, a flashback to that scene of him leaping in his mother's womb. And then you would force, you know, flip back to the present with John kind of leaping and feeling that same movement again and those pieces fitting together. So let's keep reading um, in the text and see how this encounter between John and Jesus continues to go. So John's kind of objected, like, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. It should be reversed. And then Jesus responds to that objection, which, again, from our perspective, we would seem to think John is correct, right? That John has it right, like Jesus is greater than John. Um, and then... Of, yeah, you know, this is the sinless son of the Messiah. What's he doing here? Getting a baptism of repentance. Yeah, it's John. John's the one who has committed sins. John's the one that needs to come under Jesus. But Jesus doesn't agree with that. Jesus doesn't say, oh, very good, right? The, the student has now become the master and all of that. Instead, Jesus responds like this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, let's read that together. Jesus answered and said to him, Permit me, for so it is appropriate for both of us to fill full the entirety of righteousness. So he permitted him. Okay, again, notice I like the word, two words, fill full rather than fulfill. Um, so Jesus is basically saying, look, 
This is appropriate for both of us. Not just you, John, like, oh, you need it, John, but I don't. Not just for Jesus, like, this is something I got to do, John, just go along with it. This is appropriate. This is God-pleasing. This is the will of God for both of us in order to fill full, uh, literally my translation, the literal translation, to fill full the entirety of all righteousness. I mean, that's a huge statement. And what does that mean? What in the world does it mean for Jesus to say, we have to do this. This is absolutely necessary. If we don't do this, it's all going to go patook, right? It's all going to come to naught. But doing this is going to fulfill the entirety of, of righteousness. So John baptizes with water for repentance. But here the coming Messiah will baptize with the Holy Spirit And in light of this, John says to the man that he now believes to be the Messiah, I have need to be baptized by you, uh, that is, with the Holy Spirit, right? Um, Looking with John 133 and knowing what John knows about Jesus' baptism, when John says, I need to be baptized by you, he does not mean with the water. He means with the baptism of the Messiah, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, by you. And yet you come to me for this baptism in water. That's really the clarification. It's two different baptisms, right? John's saying, I need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and yet you're coming to me for this baptism of water. Why was Jesus seeking this baptism from John? John's baptism in water symbolized repentance of sin, People came to him repenting, confessing sin, and they took his message of repentance to heart, and then they bore fruit in keeping with repentance. We talked about that. The whole idea of of repentance is is deeply connected with bearing fruit. Uh, And then they would have baptized themselves in the Jordan River with John's supervision, John's approval, John's blessing. So if Jesus was sinless, why did he seek this baptism from John? Well, here, uh, there's going to be several layers that we're going to hit on this. One of them is we're already beginning to see the work of Jesus as the Messiah. Right here, we're already seeing his ministry and the purpose of his ministry and what his ministry is ultimately going to be about and how it will find its climax at the cross. We're beginning to see it already here at the baptism. You see, when Jesus enters into those Jordan waters where sinners have come to repent and embrace the kingdom that is set before them and at their hand, what is Jesus doing when he enters into those waters too? What is he doing? He's identifying with sinners. And that's one of the chief marks of a Zadik of a righteous person, especially the Zadok HaEmet, the true righteous one, the Messiah, is that he will be identified because he will be found among the sinners. He will be found among the lepers. As we progress in Mosaic, we're going to see where the, the prophets all kind of prophesy about this, that he will descend to the lowest of the low, even to Sheol itself, in order to elevate it all. So in order to elevate, in order to bring salvation, in order to bring enlightenment to sinners and their eyes and their consciousness and their heart, the Messiah has to go down into that. That's foreshadowed even with Joseph in Genesis being put into the pit for three days and he comes out and he's brought to Egypt and there he saves the nations and eventually he saves his brothers. Here, Jesus entering into those waters, he is identifying with sinners. Uh, He's identifying with those who are repenting. So in baptism, Jesus identifies with the humanity for whom he has come to bring salvation. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther uh, would often, when he would preach on Matthew 3, would mention this concept. He would say that Jesus' baptism sanctifies the waters of my baptism. 
And here we have the Messiah becoming one with those whom he came to save. We have a Messiah, a high priest, if we put it in Hebrew's language, that knows what it is to be one of us, to experience what we experience. His baptism is what makes my baptism work. Jesus' cryptic reply when he says, permit it, for so it is appropriate for both of us to fill full the entirety of righteousness, informs us also that Jesus did not come seeking baptism for John for the, rep- for the reason of repentance. Instead, he tells us why he came for this baptism. He came to this baptism to fulfill some higher purpose known as all righteousness or the entirety of righteousness or the breath of righteousness. That's why he came. John's like, no, 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 you don't need this baptism. And Jesus' response is essentially like, yeah, I do, but I need it just like you're going to need it. We need it to fill full all righteousness through this event. The righteousness uh, that ultimately, as we progress through Mosaic and, and work through the life of Jesus, we'll see that this righteousness becomes ultimately manifest in the great exchange on the cross. But that process begins now. But there's even another sense that John and Jesus are filling full righteousness. And this is the one that kind of eluded me for a while until I finally stopped reading the Bible so chunky. Like, oh, well, I'm reading Matthew 3, so I only read Matthew 3, and I will only understand Matthew 3, and I won't really look at anything else. Oh, I'm reading Genesis chapter 50 today. I will only read Genesis chapter 50, and I will kind of read it in a vacuum and isolate it. Um, When I finally broke free of that mindset and saw the intertextuality, the the connectedness of everything, then, and that how uh, everything is kind of cyclical and spiral and repeating, then I began to see, oh, here's a pattern repeating itself with John and Jesus that of course had to had to happen. If this doesn't happen, Jesus never becomes King Messiah. Once I could sit back from the Goodyear blimp and see this pattern repeating itself generation after generation, book after book of the Bible, it finally clicked for me. You see, the book of Matthew uses this vernacular, this fulfillment terminology, this fulfillment language frequently. We've already encountered it a handful of times by chapter 3. And he does so when he is speaking in regard to messianic prophecy. Uh, So Matthew likes the language of this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Uh, It's repeated many times in Matthew. In this instance, Jesus seems to use the term all righteousness to refer to the proper way of doing things. The scriptures, the Old Testament, established a standard of protocol for king and messianic expectation. And Jesus is simply saying, you and I, John, have to follow this protocol in its proper order. Part of the righteous protocol requires a prophet, a God-ordained prophet, to arise and to declare who the anointed one is. The anointed one in Hebrew is a word known as Mashiach. We translate it as Messiah, but it doesn't just mean the one unique individual in history like Jesus. It also referred and is used throughout the Bible to refer to the high priest, to all the kings of Israel. They're called Mashiach in the Hebrew. Your English Bibles don't like to translate it as Messiah because they're afraid you'll get scared and run and think there's all kinds of Messiahs everywhere. Uh, And so they translate it the anointed one or the chosen one or the special one and so forth and so on. But the pattern is a prophet must arise and that prophet must declare and anoint the king. 
Just as, for instance, this past weekend uh, in our sermon here at Emmanuel, I, it's just amazing how everything just works. What I preached about happens to come up in Mosaic. Never know how that happens, right? The prophet Samuel, what's he do? He goes and does what? He's the prophet and he's told to do what? Go and anoint the next king of Israel. And that's David. David, of course, is the great prototype, the great foreshadowing of Messiah himself. But Samuel doesn't just do this pattern. Nathan does it with Solomon. Um, the prophet from the school of Elisha does it with Jehu. And there are other examples of it. This is the righteous way. This is the way God does things. God sends a prophet. The prophet identifies. The prophet declares. And then the prophet anoints the chosen individual of God. Moreover, the righteous protocol of the scriptures also require that for the Messiah, this can't just be any prophet. It has to be, according to Malachi, it has to be the prophet Elijah. So for Messiah, it's not just any prophet like Samuel or Elisha or Nathan. It has to be Elijah. Elijah has to precede the Messiah, has to herald his arrival, has to announce his arrival, and then has to anoint him. And so Jesus knows this pattern. Jesus knows it has to happen this way. And so Jesus says, look, we got to do it. This is the way it's been ordained. And so John gets it, and John consents to follow the protocol. Jesus stepping down into the water, Jesus and John standing there as witness to the immersion. But I want to talk more about this anointing of the Messiah because this gets more into what's happening here at this baptism and why it's so significant. Because as I said at the beginning, Jesus up until this point, especially since age 12 and for the next 20 years or so, is just a worker of hands up in the northern Galilee. There's nothing recorded of him. There's nothing of significance that the Holy Spirit ever deemed we know about that. Just 20 years of Jesus being a Jewish guy up in the northern Galilee. But John here is now proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is at hand, meaning that the messianic era has now commenced and a kingdom well, what's a kingdom need? It has to have a king, right? And the messianic heir, well, it needs a Messiah. Throughout the Old Testament, as I said, the prophets of Israel were the ones who invested men with the office of king, and they did so by ritually anointing them, most usually, with oil. That's why they were called Mashiach, because to anoint in Hebrew is Mashach. So if you get Mashached, you become a Mashiach, right? It just simply means you've been anointed. And again, you can think of Samuel uh, anointing King Saul over Israel and then also anointing King David as well. And so as I said, that Hebrew word, Mashiach in Hebrew, uh, it means Messiah, but it, more correctly, it means one who's been Mashached. It means one who has been anointed by a prophet. That's its technical definition. One who's been anointed by a prophet. The same word uh, from Hebrew and Aramaic work its way into English as Messiah. The Greek equivalent is Christos, uh, which is transliterated as Christ. Christ, though, is not a surname. It means in Greek, the anointed one, which by extension in the Greek language means king. Now I want you to tuck that away because that's going to come into play when we get into the deep teachings of Jesus. That is this term Christ, not Messiah, but Christ, specifically the Greek word as Greek was the language of the Roman Empire in the first century. That Christ, keep this in mind, has heavy, heavy political baggage. You know who was called Christ in the first century? <clears throat> the Caesars. 
If you were a Caesar, you were called Christ. You were seen as a son of God or one of the sons of the gods. You were seen as divine. You were seen as a God yourself, worthy to be worshipped. So Christ carries with it in the Roman ears, not the Jewish ears, the Roman ears of the time, you have political aspirations. You want to be a political king. And so we would do better to translate not Jesus Christ, <clears throat> but Jesus the anointed one. Or kind of look at it, Mashiach equals anointed one is where we also mean Messiah. Comes into Greek as Christos, Christ, king. That's all a big soup. All right, and we need to just kind of foreshadowing there because that's the kind of soup that makes that last week of Jesus' life a real mess. All right, because you've got religious aspirations with Mashiach and Messiah, you've got political connotations from another culture, the Roman culture, with Christos and King, Caesar. Like you could even put equals Caesar. Okay, so kind of tuck that away. If Jesus is really the anointed one, when did a prophet, and if he's the Messiah, when in the world did Elijah come to fulfill Scripture and anoint Jesus as the Messiah? Because that's what the Bible says in Malachi and other places has got to happen in order for this to be the Messiah. Prophet Elijah has to anoint him. Prophet Elijah has to declare him, identify him, and anoint him. When in the world did that happen? Matthew 11, verse 14, the words of Jesus. If you are willing to accept it, John, meaning John the Baptist himself, is Elijah who was to come. So, John is Elijah the prophet. He is identifying Jesus. When did he anoint Jesus? We didn't anoint Jesus with oil, but anointing is a religious rite. And more important than the substance used is that it's accompanied by the Spirit. The anointing symbolizes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the anointed. When the prophet Samuel anointed David with a horn of oil, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says, quote, The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David that day. So it wasn't just the oil. It was the anointing that was accompanied with the Holy Spirit. A prophet anointed David, accompanied with the Holy Spirit. That's the pattern. For the Messiah, it has to be Elijah anointing the individual, the individual having the Holy Spirit come upon him, but not come and then go or come and not be seen for a while, but come and stay. So when was Jesus anointed King Messiah? Right here at his baptism. This is his coronation. And that's why it's such a big deal. Often it gets talked about in the church as this is the beginning of his earthly ministry. And that's correct. But it's a lot more than that. It is that. That's nothing incorrect about that at all. But it's a lot more than that. Okay? And so that's why Jesus says... We got to do this. We got to do this. Because you got, you're the prophet. You got to play the prophet role. Not only are you the prophet, you're Elijah. He who has ears and is willing to accept it, you're Elijah. So you got to do this. You've got to anoint me. Because by you anointing me, then I have officially become King Messiah. Up until this point, he's not in that role. Doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it didn't exist from before creation. All those things we talked about in Mosaic teaching one, two, and three. 
but it had not manifested in time and space until this baptism. This is the coronation of King Jesus. Let's keep reading in the text. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, let's read that together. When Jesus was baptized, he quickly came up out of the water. Heaven was open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending in the likeness of a dove, and it rested upon him. Oh my goodness, there's like, there's two hours worth of stuff right there, guys, and I'm not kidding. So we're only going to hit a few, but oh my goodness, that intertextuality. Okay, first century Galilean ears, you've got them now. Where else in the world in the Bible have you ever heard about a dove and resting? Especially if I tell you the word, one, one of the Hebrew words for resting is Noah. Yeah, all right? So right there, you're already invoking hyperlink, underline blue, the salvation story of Noah, which if you look in First Peter, Peter identifies our baptism back to Noah being saved through the water. And all. I mean, you've, it's just rich there. We'll, t- we'll go back to Noah and the dove in a little bit, but there's a lot there. Um, heaven opening up. That's a quote from Scripture, right? That's, that's an exact quote from Scripture of several places of when a direct revelation from God comes. That's how the Old Testament says it comes. Heaven opens up to this individual. And then the Spirit of God descending. Again, so much there. So let's kind of hit some highlights on it, all right? So Jesus enters the waters of the Jordan. No doubt he enters in a a prayerful way, John standing in those waters as the witness, which was the custom, others waiting on the shore. Uh, Jesus' mother and brothers may have been there, uh, present among the crowd. There's a a blessing that you say before you enter into the waters or while you're entering into the waters of the mikvah, of the ritual washing. Um, It says, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us regarding the washing in water, the mikvah, right? So Jesus, no doubt, just assuming he was a God-fearing Jew of the day, would have uttered those exact words in Hebrew as he entered into those waters. The term heaven was open, one of the places that it's alluding to, one of the places it's quoting is the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. So why that's important to note, and this is for you to uh, go off on your own tangent through the week, is hyperlink on Ezekiel, right? I'll see you in a couple of years, right? right? It's bringing in Ezekiel's vision, Right? What Ezekiel's vision's about, which is called the chariot, uh, the chariot, and that's where the, the four symbols most people think are four symbols of the four gospels. They're really four symbols from Ezekiel's vision, right? It's invoking all of that into this. So it's, it's saturated with this chariot vision of Ezekiel. This phrase, as I said, the heavens were open, occurs frequently throughout Jewish literature to introduce an apocalyptic vision. In a prophetic trance, Ezekiel sees the chariot, the Merkava, as it's often called, the chariot of God descend. And in a similar vision, Jesus sees the chariot. Jesus sees the Spirit of God descend upon him as a dove. The crowd of onlookers apparently do not see this vision, but John either sees it or knows about it, understands it, is perceiving it, Because John later testifies, and this is from John chapter 1, verse 32, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. The descent of the Spirit upon Jesus fills full the Messianic prophecy from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, that the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So that's another quote or rather intertextuality connection with the resting and so forth. It's taking you to Isaiah 11 
It's also taking you to Isaiah 40, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 61. Um, but it's taking you to all these messianic prophecies. That vocabulary in that one verse 16 from Matthew 3 is taking you to so many places. So I want to talk about the dove a little bit. Why a dove? And why I want to talk about this is because Jewish tradition does not associate the Holy Spirit with a dove. That tradition developed after Jesus has ascended into heaven and after uh, a couple of generations of church has occurred. Right? In other words, it's very familiar to us, and it's okay that it is. All right, We got plenty of reasons from the Bible to identify the Holy Spirit with a dove. Nothing wrong with that, folks. Nothing wrong with that at all. Amen. Hallelujah. I support it on Pentecost. I wear my red stole, and I proudly have a dove on it, okay? But that was not the symbol in the first century Galilee on the shores of the Jordan River the day that Jesus was baptized. So this is just a adding to the depth of what you already know, believe, and cherish. And that's a great thing that you know, believe, and cherish. This is just another layer to add to the beauty of it, okay? The original first century Galilean point of simile of as a dove or in the likeness of a dove, that simile, I think it's a simile and not a metaphor, but I'm not great in English on that, um, refers not to the dove shape, in which the spirit appeared, okay? Doesn't mean they saw a dove and it doesn't mean something smoky looking like a dove descended. Rather, it's talking about the mode of descent. Luke 3 verse 22 says it this way, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form like a dove. But Mark and Matthew simply say the Holy Spirit descended as a dove descends. We tend to imagine a gentle hovering descent. But how many of you have ever been bird dived before? That's what we called it in Georgia. You ever been out in the yard before? And yeah, we got at least somebody that's been uh, had a, a, a bird dive bomb them, right? Um, you who have been uh, dive bombed, how gentle was that? It wasn't very gentle at all, right? So I want to actually read to you this story. It's by a, a Christian author uh, who kind of shares when they finally, when they kind of embraced the first century kind of approach to the Gospels, and they went to Israel, and they had this story. So this is a quote from their book. In 1986, I was walking across the Jaffa Road in Jerusalem, where there a dove came flying out of the sky and descended upon me and brushed the top of my head before disappearing again over the rooftops to which this happened several times. It was a mother bird whose nest was nearby and she was protecting her young. At any rate, it seems to me that the experience of being hit by a dove has a good parallel to being hit by the Spirit of God. If the Spirit was understood to have been like a rushing wind, I can verify that the dove coming down on someone with wings flapping is something like a very powerful rush rush of wind striking one's head with a noise of windy flurry and flapping. It is quite a shock, and it is certainly not a gentle experience. At any rate, the description of the Spirit coming down upon Jesus like a dove out of the sky seems to me a particularly apt one to explain the rushing power of God that had now singled out this one person to strike. And that's what it was. This was the one. This is the one. And God struck him. Such encounter with territorial doves would have been common for the people of Judea and Galilee. And when Jesus compares his vision to the descent of a dove, his disciples probably understood him to mean a sudden, startling rush of wind, only slightly less jarring than being struck by lightning. But there's also a connection of the dove to Noah, as well as to the story of Jonah. Jonah is in that verse, chapter 3, verse 16 in Matthew. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 11, Noah releases a dove <clears throat> to see if everything is good. <clears throat> and the dove comes back, <clears throat> the final dove comes back with, you know what, what does he come back with? It's kind of there in our picture. 
comes back with an olive leaf or a branch from the olive tree. This was a sign of salvation, a sign of life after the flood, which, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter, is a type of our baptism. The olive tree is also used to make olive oil, which is connected to the anointing of the Messiah, the Mashiach, and olive oil is also used to make light. This dove was the light of the world for Noah, and this dove was his salvation, bringing to him that branch that would produce this light and that would produce the oil to anoint the Messiah. In first century Galilean mind, that dove in Noah's story from Genesis 8, verse 11, was a foreshadowing of Messiah. Furthermore, what's interesting is if you take in Hebrew the phrase light of the world and you add up the letters because letters are numbers, it equals 358, which also equals if you add up the letters that form Messiah, the word for Messiah. So light of the world is Messiah, and it is that dove. But another dove connection, I'm just throwing some of them out to you because I told you this verse was rich. Familiar with the biblical character, the biblical book, Jonah. Jonah in Hebrew is pronounced Yonah. Yonah is really less a human being's name, though it clearly was this guy's name. But Yonah literally means dove. That's what it means. Yonah, Jonah means dove. So I want you to think into the Gospels. Some people come up to Jesus and say, hey, man, if you're the Messiah, why don't you give us a sign? And Jesus says to them, I will give you no sign except for one, the sign of Jonah. Now, yes, it's correct. There's a connection to the sign of Jonah about Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days and then being spat out, resurrected, and Jesus being in the belly of the earth and being resurrected. Yes, amen, hallelujah, you got that. That's a sign of Jonah. But if we translate that literally, there's more. This is just a more. Jesus says, you have the sign of the dove, which is then referring them back to his baptism, right? Because many of those people would have been there to see him when he was baptized. You have the sign of the dove. You have the sign of the Holy Spirit descending upon me and remaining upon me. And then another click you can do with dove is dove played an integral role in the sacrificial system. And you could go on that trail and see all kinds of gospel tangents there. But I want to leave you to have some fun, right? I wouldn't be a good rabbi if I just told you everything. I've got to just let you discover it. But Matthew 3, verse 16 is loaded, right? It is loaded. The Holy Spirit, I do want to talk about that a little bit more. The prophet Isaiah says, the Lord speaks about the Messiah when he says this. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, which is what's quoted or what Jesus hears at his baptism. Behold my servant whom I am uphold, my chosen one, <clears throat> Mashiach, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. This finds its fullness in the baptism of Jesus. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, but ruach also means wind. It also means breath. In rabbinic literature such as the Talmud or the Midrash, the sages and rabbis also use the term ruach hakodesh as to mean the Holy Spirit. And it is the equivalent of terms such as the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit of God. In the first century, this term, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God was used synonymously with the Shekinah. That is the divine dwelling presence. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon an individual is not unique to the New Testament. I've already given you one quote with David in 1 Samuel chapter 16 where the Spirit is literally says the Spirit was poured out on him. 
Moses, as well as many of the other prophets, are all described as being prophesying and having the ability to prophesy because of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the um, first century world, Holy Spirit also meant the gift of prophecy. King David composed his psalms under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures were written by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came mightily upon all of Israel's heroes, seers, and prophets. But in the case of Jesus, John chapter 3, verse 34, God gives the Spirit to Jesus without measure. And that's important. I want to read to you again from that now lost gospel of the Hebrews that Jerome and Justin and Origen like to quote. Um, It says this, It happened when the Lord ascended from the water, that is baptism, that the whole fountain of the Holy Spirit descended and rested upon him. At the moment of Jesus' baptism, all the waters of the Spirit gathered together and rested upon one single person. You see, up until that time, it was always taught the Holy Spirit did not rest continually on the prophets and the kings, but only came for a time. Came for a time when they would prophesy. It came for a time when it was for a big decision. It came for a time when it was to choose who the next king was. That they had outpourings, but it never remained continually. But John the Baptist observed that the Spirit descended upon Jesus as a dove, as it says in John 1.32, and remained upon him and never left, which was the sign of Jonah. All right, we will close there for this evening. Um, I told you it was going to be fun. I hope you found it fun. There's lots of good stuff in there. Uh, that this baptism of Jesus that we sort of just gloss over um, is huge. Even just when you're starting with, it's one of the early places. It happened at his circumcision as well. The first place he sheds blood uh, is at his circumcision. But here, it's an important way, a way in which he identifies with you and me. Uh, and by him entering into those waters, he sanctifies our waters. Uh, even just starting there in the theological um, profundity of that is amazing. All right. Uh, not to mention as we just kind of continue to keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper into that. Um, big deal. Big deal. The coronation of Messiah. This is where, yes, in one way, he was the Messiah from the foundation of the world and before the world was created. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Absolutely. But in another way, It's at his baptism that he becomes the Messiah. It's at his baptism that he becomes the Son of God. Right? All right, so let's close now with our blessing. Baruch atah Adonai notain hadavar. Blessed are you, Lord God, who has given to us the gift of the Holy Scriptures. Amen. Shalom, shalom.